Very good morning. So thank you um, to Dr. Samendra for uh, inviting me to this instruction course. So I'll be talking about how multimodal imaging makes a difference in uveitis. So we've all seen wonderful cases that you can diagnose clinically, but sometimes there are certain cases where you need to go to the extra step. So for example, this is a uh, girl who is a 10 year old, has received multiple uh, courses of oral corticosteroids over several years, and she has potentially all the complications of steroids, such as obesity, Cushingoid syndrome, hypertension, and there is a recurrence of inflammation. Now, unless you have uh, wide field angiography, especially in a pediatric case, it becomes very difficult to assess the pathology. E even if you don't have an optos, you can definitely get peripheral sweeps of fluorescein angiography with your routine camera and assess the amount of inflammation in, in these patients. So children as young as even seven year olds or six year olds can cooperate for a fluorescein and it becomes very important in the management because at this point you can take the decision of starting the patient on immunosuppression and this patient was started on azathioprine. Now similarly, we have seen some wonderful cases of TB, sarcoid from my previous speakers. Now this is a patient of intraocular TB and if you see, looking at it clinically, you have so many things going on simultaneously. So you have uh, deep choroidal lesions involving the inferior periphery and you also have a yellowish spot down at the bottom below. Um, this is of course uh, not very clear on optos, but this is an old hemorrhage. And when you realize uh, that there is neovascularization on fluorescein angiography, that's where you can exactly assess the pathology. So there is diffuse vasculitis, you have leakage, you have a cystoid macular edema and neovascularization. So at this point, you know that you have to address more than one issue. And so this patient not only requires uh, anti-TB steroids, but probably even an anti-VEGF to counter the NVE. Again, this is another patient of retinal vasculitis. Uh, and in many cases of retinal vasculitis, you will have peripheral non-perfusion. And this is again easily diagnosed on fluorescein angiography. And you can look at multiple pathologies in one frame. So you can not only look at uh, cystoid macular edema, but also vasculitis and peripheral non-perfusion. And of course, when you investigate the patient, you'll realize that there is a positive MONTU and a CECT. And based on this, uh, you can treat the patient. So you can treat all the involved areas and spare the ones which are not involved. So even if you have some residual neovascularization, it should regress once the inflammation is under control. Of course, we apart from TB, we also see several other uh, autoimmune cases of which are which were initially clubbed as white dot, but now we prefer to call them by their individual names. So you have MUDES, MPE, multifocal choroiditis, and serpiginous, and there are others which we don't very much commonly see in India, but definitely in other countries. Uh, such as uh, histoplasmosis, pick, and birdshot. Now, this is a very typical patient that we'll see in our practice. Uh, it was an Asian male. Uh, there is serpiginous choroiditis, and we also depend a lot on autofluorescence imaging to look at the stage of the disease or the activity. So if you look at this image carefully, you'll have a lot of hypo areas which indicate that the disease is inactive in those particular region, but you will have some areas which are hyper, so these areas which are hyper autofluorescent are definitely active. Now the challenge comes when you have a macular choroiditis and you have active lesions which are involving in the, uh, the central part of the macula. And this is where um, I often like to get a, a combined uh, autofl the fluorescein angiography and ICG. So in, usually in all white dots, I try to get a combined fluorescein and ICG. And when you have a combined fluorescein, if you notice the macular lesions are not very well appreciated on fluorescein. But on ICG, it becomes very apparent. So when you have a hypofluorescent lesion on ICG, it's definitely uh, you know, an active disease. And when you, if you have OCT angiography with you, you'll realize that the lesion exactly corresponds to the hyporeflectivity on OCT angio. So you can follow these patients even non-invasively once you have a baseline test. And not only that, OCT angio tells you that it is definitely a case of choriocapillaritis with inner ischemia which corresponds to ICG. So this was also uh, published in 2017. Now during follow-up, you can do a follow-up ICG uh, or and fluorescein angiography to look at the activity of the disease. Now on fluorescein, when you have this kind of a hyperfluorescence, remember this is just staining. This is not an active leakage. So the, the disease is not active because there is no leakage of the dye, even in the late phase. 
So of course you also have to look at the ICG. You have minimum disturbance of the choriocapillaries in this particular region and that's probably just a residual disease. So this is the comparison of ICG baseline when follow up and you realize that there is a minimum disturbance on the OCT angiography choriocapillary slab. So it exactly corresponds to your ICG. So the healing of lesions is accompanied by reduction in the flow deficit on OCT angio. So you can use OCT angiography to follow up these lesions periodically. So you can see the resolution. Now this becomes important especially when you want to plan a therapeutic intervention. For example, you want to initiate uh, immunosuppression or let's say you are at a point where you want to start tapering immunosuppression. So you can look at these images. And even if you have a placoid chorioretinitis, you can see that on ICG, the moment you have this hypo area, which is the active lesion, you know that the disease is active. And this is exactly the same picture that you get on OCT angiography. So you have a hypo edge. And the moment it's healed, it becomes like this. So you have a mishmash of uh, intervening choriocapillaries and deep choroidal vessels, but th and there is a choriocapillaries atrophy, but the disease does not have an active hypo edge, so it's no longer active. In these placoid chorioretinitis, I have realized that you cannot always depend on autofluorescence. Because if you look at autofluorescence, you will have a lot of hyper areas in the center. And this is often because you have a lot of subretinal fibrosis, and you have many other things going on apart from inflammation. So you can not always depend on autofluorescence and so a repeat ICG in especially placoid cases or if you have a follow-up OCT NGO, it works very well and you can decide uh, your treatment based on this. Now this is something not very commonly seen in India but you may occasionally come across an MPE. So the difference between MPE and serpiginous or any multifocal choroiditis is that you have the lesion all the lesions are of the same age. They all come together. There is no biphasic lesion or you don't have one lesion coming today, another lesion coming after one week. And MPE comes all together. And usually the OCT itself is very diagnostic because you have some choriocapillaries ischemia, some thickening of choriocapillaries and diffuse loss of photoreceptors in the center. This is, uh, this is definitely an MPE with ellipsoid zone disruption photoreceptor disruption and a placoid lesion on ICG. So again, the OCT NGO will show you the same picture. So you have placoid pattern of choriocapillaries deficit, flow deficit, and it's a primary choriocapillaritis. Now VKH is a, this is a classic textbook picture and a lot of friends often tell me that I have a unilateral VKH, but remember, unless you have an ICG, you cannot really say if it's a unilateral or a bilateral disease. VKH by definition is a bilateral disease. Um, and you can see this is our textbook uh, picture of like a choroidal granulomas in the stroma. And the fluorescein shows you these multiple hyper areas with pooling of the dye. So this is nothing but VKH. And in VKH, you can have compartmentalization of fluid uh, on the OCT. But this is not specific to VKH. You can also find it in MPE and other disorders. So I think I'll just take half a minute uh, this is a publication on basilary layer detachment in VKH. I'll not go into details, but it essentially means the same thing, the compartmentalization of fluid in uh, VKH. Uh, the last case that I'd like to show you is based on this publication, differentiating the TB and sarcoid granuloma. So if you have a very large choroidal granuloma, you can image it using um, OCT and Nitin showed you a case of, uh, choroidal, will show you a case of choroidal granuloma subsequently. But you can see that when you have this outer retinal fuzziness or infiltration with subretinal fluid, then it's definitely going in favor of TB and not sarcoid. On the other hand, if you have well circumscribed choroidal granulomas without much of subretinal fluid or outer retinal infiltration, it goes in favor of sarcoidosis. Of course, you have to look at systemic uh, investigations like chest CT and other MON2 and other tests. So with this, I think I'd like to end. If there are any questions, we can take it probably at the end. Thank you.